Ist das ihr Ehemann? Ihr Bruder? Ihr Sohn? No, no, it's just something I heard on the radio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. November 7th, 1941. There is a bit of a lull in the war in the Soviet Union just now as autumn turns to winter. But make no mistake, plans are afoot. Plans for huge offensives, but they are everywhere. Plans in Russia, plans in Africa, and plans in Japan. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the German drive on Moscow, Operation Typhoon, was halted in large part because the autumn rains, the Rasputitsa, had turned the Soviet roads into impassable mud. The Germans were still advancing in the Crimea, though, and at sea, a German U-boat sank a neutral American destroyer. I ended last week with a quote by David Glantz about November 1st, 1941. And just for fun, I'll start today with another one about the same day. German commanders and soldiers of all ranks tried to reconcile four contradictory realities. First, the Wehrmacht had won stunning victories across the entire front, which it was necessary to exploit. Second, the arrival of the Rasputitsa, after which winter would surely follow, would complicate that exploitation. Third, the increasing debilitated state of the Wehrmacht, in particular its mechanized forces. Fourth, and most sobering, Many Germans finally began to appreciate the resilience and staying power of the Red Army and Soviet soldier. And all the victories and gains have come at a price. By November 1st, the Germans have taken 686,000 casualties. If you take the original attacking force June 22nd and add in all the replacements, that's 20% of it. Right now, the Germans field 2.7 million men. As for their equipment, just a third of the motor vehicles still run, and the Panzer divisions are at 35% full strength. Advancing even further eastward may bring more tactical victories, sure, but at what further cost to logistics and supply? It's hard enough to bring in fuel and ammunition as is, but to continue over the winter would mean bringing in winter clothing and supplies and all sorts of construction materials to boot. So in light of all this, on the 4th, Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt asks that his army group, Army Group South, be allowed to stop, like now, and rebuild and prepare for an offensive in 1942. As for the Red Army, German intel says they have 160 divisions and 40 brigades in the West on all fronts, most at below half strength. In reality, as of November 1st, the Red Army has 269 divisions and 65 brigades, but they have been reduced to a total of 2.2 million men. But, and this is important, those numbers are growing like crazy. By the beginning of December, they should field over 4 million men in 343 divisions and 98 brigades. Adolf Hitler is still totally optimistic though, and his army chief of staff, Franz Halder, thinks the Soviets are no longer capable of defending a full continuous front. So they'll have to focus on defending just Moscow and the Caucasus while they raise forces for the future. So he wants to hit communications and industrial centers. Today, the 7th, he comes out with his plan called Concerning the Continuation of Operations Against the Enemy Grouping Between the Volga and Lake Ladoga. Catchy name. He wants to send the 3rd and 4th Panzers northeast to Yaroslavl and Rybinsk to begin another huge encirclement. There is a maximum version of the plan and a minimum one. The minimum one calls for advancing to a line 50 kilometers east of Lake Ladoga, southeast to 275 kilometers east of Moscow, and down to Rostov. But the maximum one is for a further advance to Vologda, Gorky, Stalingrad, and Maikop. This would cut off access to the northern ports and the industrial regions around Moscow and down south. This is pretty ambitious for an army with major mechanical and fuel issues. But they've been telling the home front that victory is just about there for a while now, and they have to try to back that claim up. The Allies have been busy trying to expose the credibility gap between what the German public is being fed by German propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels and what is really happening. 
he notes that foreign propaganda seems filled with a new hope and that the German people are now publicly wondering where the great victory is. More people are tuning into foreign broadcasts than ever, and British propaganda is playing on that. The BBC Foreign Service broadcasts a ticking clock, and every seven seconds in German, a voice says things like, every seven seconds a German dies in Russia. Is it your husband? Is it your son? Is it your brother? They're not targeting just the Germans at home either. Troops on the Eastern Front are fed glowing reports of the successes of British bombers in Germany. Airdrop leaflets by the Soviets also add to this exaggeration. One claims that the German newspapers are withholding the scale of the destruction, and a thousand tons of bombs were dropped on Cologne in under a week. Another says that women are now working 12-hour days for 40% of the men's wages. These are your wives and sisters. Of course, a lot of this is simply not believed. But the one thing that no one can deny that the Soviets repeatedly hammer on is their losses the dead and the wounded. You can't refute that when you see it day after day with your own eyes. There are by now many instances of German soldiers shooting themselves in the hand or the leg to be sent away to lead a less dangerous life because they'd have a greater chance of survival. The real problem is that the Germans are winning all the battles, but they're not exactly winning the war. But the Germans are far from the only ones making plans for offensives. It is now November, and the Allied offensive in North Africa draws ever closer. Alan Cunningham, who's designing and commanding the offensive, has put his three armored brigades, most of his armor, into the 30th Corps under Willoughby Norrie. This is going to be the spearhead. The infantry is assembled in the 13th Corps under Alfred Godwin Austin. Now, we saw Cunningham in overall command of the successful East Africa campaign, as you may remember. But this is the first time he's commanded a tank army. The 8th Army has in total around 700 tanks, and Irvin Rommel, leading the opposition, has like 390. Half of Norrie's tanks are the New Crusaders, and in fact the whole operation takes its name from the tanks. Operation Crusader. Crusaders are fast and well armored, although not the world's best mechanically, and come armed with a two-pounder gun. What are pretty solid mechanical tanks are the American Stuart models they have, though, which can reach over 60 kilometers per hour. So they're the fastest tanks in the Sahara. Their 37 millimeter guns are maybe a tad stronger than the Crusaders, but their big issue is range. They are serious gas guzzlers. Rommel has not because of the invasion of the Soviet Union, gotten any major reinforcements since June. But he's reorganized his Africa Corps into three divisions, the 15th Panzer, the 21st Panzer, and the 90th Light Infantry. Italian infantry is still the bulk of his foot soldiers. His go-to tank is the Mark III, which we've talked about on the Eastern Front. They're pretty reliable, and their 50 millimeter gun hits about as hard as the Crusaders do. Not the world's best armor, though. Rommel does have 35 Mark IVs with these 75mm howitzers, and they're pretty alright. He has 70 Mark IIs that only come armed with machine guns, and 146 of his tanks are Italian models that do not have much armor and are prone to mechanical breakdowns. One thing, which I've mentioned a couple times before, that the Axis do have the advantage in is anti-tank weaponry, specifically the 88mm guns. These are real bad boys, as we've seen. Rommel has 35 of them and 150 mm anti-tank guns, which have better range and power than the two-pounders the British also use as anti-tank weapons. Rommel also uses his anti-tank guns and his armor differently from the British. For one thing, he uses anti-tank guns on offense and not just defense, and if he can get away with it, will send them in the advance line to knock out enemy tanks while his armor would go into action where it was more lethal against supply columns, infantry, and artillery positions. Here's something interesting from Steven Sears. There were other, more fundamental differences in the two forces. In the German army, a panzer division was a mixture of all arms, tanks, artillery, infantry, anti-tank guns working in close cooperation. Rommel could shift his mobile forces anywhere on the battlefield without them being out of balance. This could be not done so easily in the 8th Army. Not only did the separate services, artillery, infantry, armor, jealously guard their independence, but Cunningham had a wide assortment of nationalities to deal with. 
Australians, Englishmen, Indians, New Zealanders, and South Africans have different military habits and did not always mesh when thrown together in an emergency. Well, the countdown until the offensive has begun. And it is not the only one. The Japanese will continue to negotiate with the US, but they give those talks a deadline of the 29th to bear fruit. Proposal A, one of two proposals approved the 5th at Imperial Conference, is sent to the US. It's kind of a non-starter since it has no concessions beyond those already offered in the past, does not offer to leave the tripartite pact, and demands that Japan be allowed to keep troops in China for decades. The US is aware of the deadline because they are intercepting and reading the Japanese diplomatic code used, though they can't read the naval codes, but they don't know what the deadline implies. Well, Japan under the new Tojo government is committed to going to war against British and Dutch colonial possessions to get the oil, tin, and rubber they need that they can no longer buy. They're not worried about the opposition they're likely to face. Britain has its hands full in Europe, North Africa, the Mediterranean, and the Atlantic, and the Netherlands is under German occupation. So they plan on invading a whole bunch of places at once in early December. In fact, the only Navy that could conceivably be a problem to this is that of the neutral United States. The US controls the Philippines, and while the Japanese could just bypass them, they think doing so and having the US on their flank is super risky, and long-range bombers from places like the Philippines could maybe hit Tokyo. So they have a plan to knock out as much of the American Pacific fleet as possible all at once, at the same time as they launch all those other offensives. This plan is extremely daring and audacious and was devised by commander of the combined fleet Isoroku Yamamoto and the famous pilot Minoru Genda. This calls for secretly sailing the Kido Butai, the first air fleet, the world's largest carrier fleet, across the Pacific to catch the US fleet napping at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Now, I promise that soon I will talk so much about this that it will make your head spin. The politics, the diplomacy, the people, the technology, the plans, the backstory, the whole nine yards. You will get it in more depth than I'm pretty sure any documentary has ever covered. Just be patient. The plan, actually, was only finally approved recently after Yamamoto repeatedly threatened to quit if it wasn't, and the Japanese didn't think they could afford to lose their top commander on the eve of war. Well, this week, the actual orders go out to the combined fleet, and on the 6th, Japanese planes make a practice run for Pearl Harbor at Kagoshima Bay. So, as this week comes to an end, there is a clock ticking in Japan, one in North Africa, and one in the Soviet Union, all for large-scale offensive operations. On November 6, Joseph Stalin addresses the Soviet Union and the world. You might think a leader talking to his people is a fairly mundane event, but this is apparently only the second time in his entire rule he has done so, the first being July 2nd. This is broadcast from a Moscow party rally in Mayakovsky metro station on the eve of the 24th anniversary of the revolution that brought the Bolsheviks to power. He says that the Soviets have lost 450,000 soldiers killed, though well over a million more casualties, but the Germans have lost over 4.5 million killed, wounded, and prisoners over the war. Victory is near. Well, he says a lot more than that, and there's a link to the whole speech in the description. He says that the invaders, the National Socialists, are neither nationalist nor socialist, and he explains that pretty well, actually. What they are is crows decked in peacock feathers, but no matter how much crows may deck themselves in peacock feathers, they will not cease to be crows. And these men, bereft of conscience and honor, these men with the morals of beasts, have the insolence to call for the extermination of the great Russian nation. The German invaders won a war of extermination with the peoples of the USSR. Well, if the Germans won a war of extermination, they will get it. From now on, our task will be to exterminate every single German who has set his invading foot on the territory of our fatherland. Well, that was a rather dark and somber ending for an episode, and I'm now going to rather abruptly change the direction by inserting myself right here 
with a World War II in real-time public service announcement. It's not really a spoiler to anyone in 2020, some of the events that happened later in 1941. And the day that this comes out, if you are watching this the day it comes out, it is exactly 30 days until the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which was part of Japanese offensives that same day all over Southeast Asia. And as many of you know, on December 7th, we will be covering the Pearl Harbor attack minute by minute in real time for five hours as it happens starting at 6 10 a.m local hawaiian time if you're wondering what time that would mean for you uh 6 a.m hawaii is i think at 8 a.m in los angeles in california which would be 11 in washington dc which would be 5 p.m greenwich mean time 6 p.m central european time and 11 p.m tokyo time so you can figure out if I'm right, when you're going to be able to watch it. But you have the magic of the internet to look all that up. This will be presented partly as we've done it. I will still be the host, and uh, there'll be a lot of archival footage like we use in the regular episodes. We will also have, we'll have some voice actors who are doing some of the personal recollections from that day. But we're also doing something that I don't think anyone's ever done on this kind of scale. We're going to be replaying a lot of the fighting in the air and at sea in a computer game engine. So you have like absolutely awesome looking modern computer game footage recreations of the actual attacks that day. And to do that, we are doing a collaboration with World of Warships and World of Warplanes. That's two games by Wargaming, wargaming.net, where you can play aerial and naval war over a network. Now, as many of you know, we do not do sponsorships or collaborations or partnerships unless the person or the, the product or whatever we're doing it with specifically adds value to you for whatever episode or series we happen to be doing with those people. And Wargaming, well, World of Warships, for example, specifically adds awesome value to the Pearl Harbor series. In fact, you can check some of that out right now. Two torpedo bombers are making a run for the Nevada, anchored alone off Ford Island. The ship's machine gunners open fire on the planes and bring one down before it can drop its load, but the second drops. See, that's really cool, right? And there's gonna be a bunch of that helping to illustrate the fighting so you get a clearer idea of how it all worked out. Um, and Wargaming has also helped us put together the final financing so we can actually afford to do this in, in the first place. That was begun, and the bulk of it was done by the Time Ghost Army. So before I say anything else, I'd like to say an enormous heartfelt thanks to the Time Ghost Army for getting this ball rolling so we could actually do this, and an enormous heartfelt thanks to Wargaming.net for finishing it off so we can actually do this. And in fact, um, if you go to World of Warships, well, you can follow this link if you want to play World of Warships, and there's a special goodie bag for viewers of World War II in real time. The link will come up there in just a minute. If you have not joined the Time Ghost Army, you should definitely do so at patreon.com or timeghost.tv, and you should subscribe to this channel, and very importantly, ring the bell to get notifications. I usually sort of hop over that because I don't really like the bell thing, but this time it's super important because this does not come out on a Saturday. So it's not our regular weekly content that you're sort of attuned into watching each and every single week. So if you ring the bell, then you will get the notification that this has come out and then you and all your friends and your family and your loved ones and your school and your enemies, you can all sit down on December 7th for five straight hours and watch the most in-depth, most colorful, coolest, and I'm just going to go ahead and say best, but you know, you got to see it first, documentary that's ever been done on Pearl Harbor. See you next time. Mm -hmm.